The title of our talk is Resolving Algorithmic Fairness. And what we aim to do is to provide a conceptual framework to think about algorithmic fairness and resolving it in, in a way that hopefully will become clear as we go along. So just to give you a bit of uh, background here, um, start with the idea of predictive algorithm. Uh, so predictive algorithms are used in a variety of context and application in healthcare, in uh, assignment of wealth for benefit, in uh, the criminal justice system, in um, uh, the banking industry. And what they do is that they assign scores to individuals, the scores that between a certain range. And the scores is used to predict a behavior or a condition of interest, which could be sickness in the medical context, the ability to repay a loan in the banking context or the need for housing, if you are planning welfare benefit or recidivism or more generally criminality in uh, the criminal justice context. The, the higher the score, uh, supposedly, the, the more likely the behavior or the condition of interest is gonna be. So the basic picture here, is that we're starting with, with a large set of data and then we have some predictive analytics or so machine learning techniques, mining through this data, looking for correlations between uh, attributes, uh, observable or knowable attributes of an individual and then uh, uh, finding correlation between those attributes and uh, the, the outcome uh, that we want to predict. And so this, uh, through that process, we build a risk model that is this abstract representation of that correlation between attributes and uh, the outcome we want to predict. And we use the risk model to make uh, the prediction. Now, it, it turns out, perhaps not uh, so surprisingly, that even though uh, this predictive algorithm promised to be uh, free from human bias, they themselves exhibit various forms of bias and there is a large uh, literature on that. And a number of people argue that uh, this predictive algorithm exacerbates existing inequity in, in society. And the, the, the paper or the piece, the journalistic piece that started this debate and brought it into the public light is the ProPublica piece, uh, Machine Bias, which I'm sure uh, everybody is, is familiar with in, in this audience. So, um, uh, this is a, a, a battle, a battleground between those who, who are rather critical of, of predictive algorithm and, and machine learning algorithm, and those instead, and those who instead have a much more positive view of them. And um, our um, take on this, as we become uh, clear in the talk, is is try to try to understand from a conceptual and theoretical point of view why it is so hard for a predictive algorithm to deliver a fair decision um, uh, across uh, different groups, for example, across different racial groups. But before uh, getting to the point, um, I think it's important to get clear with, with the terminology. And so I hope you'll indulge with me with, with a bit of, of formal uh, preliminaries. Uh, so the first uh, notion that I want to get clear uh, with is the notion of a risk model. The risk model is this formal representation of a certain relationship between a bunch of attributes and the outcome we want to predict. Um, and um, in particular, the way Robin and I want to understand the risk model, which might be a little bit non-standard, uh, is to think about a individual as a collection of attributes. And so you can think about the individual as in fact an infinite collection of attributes. And so we use this X arrow infinity to denote an individual. Um, then there is the outcome Y, which is the outcome we want to predict. And that's a function of the attributes that characterize the individual. And then there is uh, the group G, which is one of the attributes of the individual. Now, the, uh, when we um, use the risk model to make uh, the prediction, inevitably, we are going to rely on a subset of this infinite uh, number of attributes, because only a certain number of attributes are observable, only a certain number of attributes are accessible in various ways. And so the risk model is going to yield a prediction in, in terms of a score or a risk scores 
And the prediction is gonna be based on a limited set of these attributes, which we call XP. So X1 all the way up to XP. Um, and we call these attributes in, used in the model uh, predictors, or some people call it risk factors. The terminology is not really uniform. There. And each of these attributes is associated with a certain regression coefficients that uh, expresses the strength of the correlation between the attributes, the predictor, and the outcome of interest. So here is an example in, in the criminal justice context. This is the uh, public safety assessment risk model, which is used in, in, in a variety of jurisdictions in the United States. So the outcome uh, to be predicted here is the, the new criminal activity of an individual. Then you have the various risk factors or predictors, such as age at current arrest or, or, or pending charge at the time of offense, et cetera. And then on the right-hand side of the table, you have the various points, which are essentially those regression coefficients. So they indicate the strength of the correlation between each of those predictors or risk factors and the outcome of interest. So that's the first kind of theoretical or, or, or formal preliminary is the notion of risk model. The second uh, formal preliminary is, is um, um, the uh, various formal notions of, of fairness, of, of group fairness in, in particular. As the literature on algorithmic fairness has a proliferation of measures of fairness, and it's really hard to kind of you know, uh, orient yourself in this, in this large literature. So what Robin and I have done just to simplify things a little bit is just to look at uh, group uh, fairness uh, criteria under two different uh, perspectives, which we call classification parity and predictive parity. And the basic difference here is what you are, the variables you are conditioning on. So in one case, you're conditioning on the outcome. So you're conditioning on Y, which is the outcome you want to predict and you're conditioning on the group. And then you see what is the prediction made by your risk model. In the case of predictive parity, so the other perspective on uh, group fairness, you are conditioning on the prediction made by uh, the model, the score S, and then you look at what the actual outcome is. And uh, an example of classification parity is equality in false positive and false negative rates. And so the important thing here is to just know that we are conditioning on Y equals zero, or we are conditioning on Y equal one. And we want those, um, uh, false positive and false negative rates to be the same across whatever group of interest we consider, for example, across different racial groups. There are different instantiation or examples of this classification parity idea. When we talk about equal positive, false positive and equal false negative rates, we are thresholding our score at a certain value so we require the score to be above or below a certain threshold A, but we don't have to do that. And another example of classification parity that does not rely on thresholding a score is, is called balance. But the, the, the common thing is that in, in any case, we are conditioning on the outcome. Um, whereas when it comes to predictive parity, we are no longer conditioning on the outcome, we, but we are conditioning on the score. And so a, a typical example is equality in a positive predictive value. Um, and so you see that uh, here we are requiring that uh, the positive predictive value be equal across the two groups, conditional on the score being above a certain threshold A. Um, now, uh, the literature on algorithmic fairness, uh, probably one of the most interesting aspects of that literature are these impossibility theorems. There is a variety of them, but the basic idea of these theorems is that these different uh, fairness criteria, which are uh, desirable in their own way, they cannot be simultaneously uh, satisfied. They cannot be simultaneously satisfied if the prevalence rate across the different groups we are considering are different. And this assumption is a fairly natural assumption because given how society is structured, it is not, um, it is not common for different racial groups, for example, to have uh, similar, similar rates of uh, whatever behavior or condition we, we want to predict. 
So a natural question here is, well, why is fairness, what we call perfect fairness, meaning fairness along all these different dimensions, so difficult to achieve? What is the deep reason behind that? There are a variety of answers that we could give here. You could, you could perhaps blame the data, saying that the data are bad or flawed in some way. You could, you could blame the, uh, the risk model, it's sad, say that there is some mistake in how the risk model has been constructed. Now, our strategy uh, will be uh, slightly different. And what we're going to do is first, we're building an ideal, we're going to build an ideal risk model that delivers perfect fairness, right? which all the measures of fairness are satisfied. And then we examine the assumptions that are required, the various assumptions that are required or that make possible having perfect fairness. We relax those assumptions and we witness a progressive uh, degradation uh, or departure away from perfect fairness. And we provide a theoretical framework to think about this degradation. And this is a framework that we borrow uh, from the literature in, in, in statistical about model predictive accuracy and individual risk. So that's the, the general uh, plan. Okay, so um, the first thing here is um, a, um, a simulation. So this is uh, basically the setup here is that we are generating our data, we are simulating our data. And then we, on this basis, we are constructing our ideal risk model. So how are we uh, generating our data? So we're thinking about a, a large set of individuals, each possessing 20 attributes. And these, these attributes could be, um, of, of, could be socioeconomic status, age, uh, educational levels, et cetera. And we're assuming that eight of these 20 attributes are correlated in some way with group membership. Uh, so for example, educational levels or socioeconomic uh, level could be very well correlated with, with race. So they, they're some, somewhat uh, proxy of race if, if they're combined in a certain way. And then we have other attributes that are not correlated with race at all. You could think about age, for example, maybe not correlated with race at all. And then um, we assume that there is some deterministic function that given uh, what the attributes of an individual are, gives us um, the outcome of interest, the, uh, the, the behavior or the condition that we want to predict. So there is a deterministic relation between the attributes, whether an individual possesses or doesn't possess certain combination of attributes and the outcome of interest. Um, so this is how we assume the world to be uh, kind of uh, regulated. And then we are now generating this data. We are generating data in greater numbers. And we are dividing the data into two, into training data set and a test data set. Uh, how, how many, how big are our data sets with 10 at the power of five? So we have 100,000. Uh, individuals essentially. And the difference between the training data set and the test data set, uh, besides how these data sets are used, is that the, um, the group G uh, in, the, in the training data set, we have 40% of individuals are in group one. And then in the test data set, 60% of individuals are in group uh, one. So we, there's a slight difference between, between the two, just, just to make things a little more, more realistic. And finally, um, so we have all our data. Uh, we have kind of this, this generation of the world uh, that we've simulated. And on that, we can build our risk model. So what we did, we, we fit a certain regression model on the training data. We evaluate uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the risk model that we get on, on the test data. We optimize and we get this ideal risk model to make our prediction. And as it turns out, this ideal risk model is really good. So it, end up, uh, it ends up uh, predicting, um, um, in, it ends up performing very, very well on both the dimension of predictive parity. So it means that the, the, uh, there is very, very little difference 
uh, between how uh, the risk model and the prediction made by the risk model perform for one group versus another. So there is a difference in policy predictive value by 0.013%, so very small. Same thing with uh, classification parity, which is the other notion of, of fairness that I introduced earlier. Uh, the difference in false positive rate and false negative rates in um, um, uh, between the two groups are very, very small. And if we look at, at the accuracy of the risk model, so independently of this comparative notion of fairness, uh, the, the model performs pretty well. So all the classification are correct. So there are only 10 errors out of 100,000 instances. And um, the out of sample square error loss, which is the difference between the true, the true outcome, which in this case is either zero, one, and the predictive outcome, which is a probability between zero and one. Even there, we have we have a, a squared. Uh, even there, we have a, uh, it's uh, the out of sample square error loss is, is very very low. So so this algorithm performs great on both fairness measures and accuracy measures. So how did we get there? How did we get to this to this kind of idealized situation? And here uh, in this slide, you see listed the number of attribute, the number, sorry, the number of, of conditions or idealized assumption that, that, we, that we use. Um, so first, all the attributes that were relevant for making the prediction were observable and used in the risk model. So we had full information, nothing was left out. Second, our training sample was both large and representative. So there was no, the training sample was not skewed in any way and was pretty large. Third, we made a deterministic assumption. So if you recall, there is a deterministic function from a certain combination of attributes and the outcome of interest. And Robin will talk about that more in detail later. And then finally, no attributes, no predictors in our model that we used was misleading. They were all correct. They were all uh, true and reliable predictors. So the model was, was well specified in that sense. So what happens if we drop the first assumption, for example? Uh, if we, um, so here is what happens to predictive accuracy. So these are non-comparative uh, measures. How good are the prediction uh, of, the, of our uh, risk model compared to the true outcomes. And you see that as we, as we take fewer and fewer prediction into account, we move further and further away from, uh, from a zero squared error loss. And when, when, the, when the squared error loss is zero, you have perfect predictive accuracy. So, so as we have fewer and fewer uh, predictors, we, we move further away from this uh, perfect predictive accuracy. Now, when it comes to the comparative measure of fairness, we see a similar degradation, but things are a little bit more complicated. So uh, let's start with the, with the picture on the right-hand side. Um, so we have uh, predictive parity um, sort of um, goes uh, progressively uh, down as you move away from, uh, from the, the 20 attributes as you, as you employ fewer and fewer attributes. When it comes to classification parity on the left-hand side, it's a little bit different in the sense that the, the, the interesting thing is that you have perfect classification parity at the two extremes. When you have a the full range of attributes or predictor that you use, or when you have zero predictors. And so, and in between, uh, classification parity kind of varies in ways that are not fully um, explainable. Um, now, what we could do now here is uh, dropping the other assumption progressively. So dropping the second, the third, and the fourth uh, assumption um, and uh, determinism and model specification. And what we get, we get a progressively degradation of predictive accuracy that you see here, the, 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 the last um, plot, the plot on the top, the one that is kind of with, with the little um, circles. This is the one in which we have inserted predictors that are not truly indicative of the outcome. So they're kind of uh, not, not, not true predictors. And you see that even if you use a 30 predictor, you cannot really get to zero squared error loss. So you, you can never approximate 
uh, complete predictive accuracy. And a similar degradation you see when it comes to the various measures of fairness, as you drop our assumption, it becomes increasingly more difficult to get to full, um, um, to full uh, fairness. And this one is the one in which we have uh, introduced uh, predictors that are, that are not truly tracking the, the outcome that we want to predict. And so you see that even if you use a lot of predictors, you cannot get to uh, full um, um, equality in positive predictive value. You cannot get uh, also equality in, um, in uh, false positive rate or false negative rates, etc. But interestingly, in this case, if you use zero predictors, you're still performing extremely well in terms of the various measures of classification uh, parity. So I think I'm going to hand it over to Robin now, who will give you a more, a more theoretical um, understanding of what's going on here. So Robin, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. OK. Uh, okay. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, let me pull up the slides from my side and put this to full screen, I think. There. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, so this is a, a lot of simulations that we have done for you and put in front of you. And I just wanted to, you know, as I take over, and I wanted to invite you to kind of step back a little bit and really to explain to you why are we trying to look at things in this particular way? Are we, why are we trying to kind of peel this uh, perfect fairness, you know, layer by layer to the bare bones where we no longer have it? So this all comes down to um, what we believe as a fundamentally as a modeler or as an institution who employ a algorithm to make predictive guesses about people's personal individual outcome, there is always a implied notion of individual risk that this algorithm is after. However you like it or not, we are estimating something and the something is what we conceive as the notion of individual risk. What is exactly this individual risk and how should we conce conceive that though? Um, you know, it, it, Marcelo introduced earlier that we'd like to think about it and every individual uh, to the full extent of their individuality as expressed as this infinite vector of attributes, which is at infinity. And we also like to invite you to think about it. Suppose that we have, uh, we have access to this almighty model that's so rich and so correct that somehow if we were to be able to access this infinite information about an individual, this model S infinity would be able to in fact deliver the ideal risk about this person um, in, in the full extent of exactness. And this is, it can, you can't get really more idealistic than this to call that number the individual risk of a person X infinity. But of course that is all very conceptual and you know, uh, kind of dive into this world of intangible uh, you know, attributes. So let's step a little back a little bit and think about in reality, we can't really, you know, have your hands and measure all the possible possible attributes of a person, but rather only the ones that can be observed practically. And we can still think about having a great algorithm that can deliver the best risk quantified based on these practically observable information. And we may well call that to be our conceptualization of individual risk. That is not even quite practical because in reality, in the context of criminal justice or in hospitals or in the context of you know, clinical diagnosis and so on, uh, we have this notion that some information cannot be deemed uh, admissible into the predictive algorithm. We can only have access to a limited set of information that can be used. And things that would be excluded, for example, is for example, the very notion of group might be thought of as in, inadmissible or sensitive attributes or things that perhaps have to do with the static features of people. Uh, those things we, maybe we do not have access. And but still we're thinking about delivering ideally as best as we can a risk quantification of based on the limited information we have XP of this person. And that even not, is not all the story because in reality in order to deliver and to fit the model, we have to somehow use a perhaps limited set of training data. So this difference between the third and the fourth 
uh, here is the notion, the theta being indexed here for the risk model one here, we use the theta star to, to, to say that perhaps this would be the best model that had we had access to everybody in this world, that this is how we can, and this, you know, without the, the task of estimation, this would be uh, the, the true parameters that govern the risk. Whereas in reality, we have to estimate this with a theta hat based on limited training sets. So why are we talking about all these different layers of possible uh, notions of individual risk is that in the context of understanding predictive accuracy, uh, we do have uh, well-established frameworks from the statistical literature that could help us understand how these accuracy uh, or the lack of accuracy really decompose in terms of how we conceptualize the notion of individual risk. And this is thanks to the multi-resolution framework, which was proposed by Professor Xiaoli Ming and also advanced very recently by a paper uh, Li and Meng to, to appear in the Journal of uh, uh, American Association of Statistics. So, um, you know, the reference is there towards the end, which we can see. Uh, but I wanted to explain how this framework uh, that decomposes algorithm accuracy can really help us understand uh, this, our, our you know, goal towards achieving fairness is that if we think about every one of these risk scores as potentially being uh, what we conceptualize as the ideal risk score we want to call as our target, we can ask the question, just how far away are we in terms of using that individual risk in approximating the overall uh, ultimate outcome of the individual? And in particular, you can see that all these risk scores are arranged from the lower resolution, which is practically what we can deliver with the limited information at the lower resolution, all the way to the highest resolution where we can have this almighty risk model that can have access to everybody's risk, uh, everybody's attributes. And depending on where we want to, what, at what resolution we want to call this conceptualized individual risk, what is going to be in between our target individual risk and the ultimate outcome that is going to be called a bias, not in the sense of fairness, but rather in the sense of estimation bias. So this is a discrepancy between our, the, the, the target individual risk and the ultimate outcome. And what is between what is practically achievable and the individual risk is the variance or practically speaking, just how difficult it is for us to be able to deliver on uh, this idealized the risk model. Now, the examples that we've been showing you, and especially the first one where we were able to achieve perfect accuracy, that was an instance where we are taking away all this fuzz about variance or difficulty of estimation. We're using a perfect simulation, large sample example to say that we are conceiving ourselves as if we are the oracle that who knows everything about the individual. This is our conceptualized uh, notion of individual risk at the highest resolution, and we are able to deliver that because we know the right model, we're delivering that. But there's a still a question. The question now becomes, even if we can have access and deliver S infinity, is that the end of the story? Or to, to put in a different way, in a more technical way, is our expected square error loss between S infinity and the actual outcome, is that number larger than zero or equal to zero? And this becomes a really philosophical this debate, whether we think that the world ultimately is deterministic or there is a truly some kind of objective chance that dictates the outcome of individuals. Now, to be clear, the question of whether this quantity is zero or larger than zero in the context of classical model fitting predictive algorithms, it doesn't matter because all people care about is to push this bias as small as possible to get as close to zero as we can. And if we can get to zero, it's fine. But in the case of fairness, whether we are exactly at zero or not makes a world of difference. The way that we instill determinism into our simulation, as Marcelo had mentioned, was that we initially set up this simulation to say that the outcome of the individual is in fact a deterministic outcome of this probit score that is essentially a transformed version of a weighted sum of the individual's attributes. We're going to swap that out into what we call the objective chance assumption, which is another way you can think about the world, namely, there is truly this probit score, this transformed version of the sum of the attributes, that is a fractional number that truly dictates the 
propensity of which this person would come out to have a positive outcome and the oracle somehow flips a coin. And this randomness is not something that we can get hold of ever. Now, if we are to use that as the new assumption for the simulation by endorsing the objective chance assumption, on the left-hand side, you see that these are the true, so-called true risks for these 10, 100,000 people in the test data. By the flip of a coin mechanism, this realizes to the simulated actual observations, the binary outcomes. And if we were to use the uh, a great model, this is fitted on a large representative training set to try to capture um, this, uh, the, this true risk, we see that you know, the estimated risk, the risk captures the true risk very well. But this distribution on the right is very far off from the actual outcome. Therefore, in terms of as far as accuracy is concerned, we are not there. Even if we are using all the useful and actually truthful predict predictors to fit the model, we are not able to achieve absolute accuracy and by in so doing also failing to achieve classification parity, however you like to measure it, as well as predictive parity as here measured by the positive predictive value. So what we have really shown you, and this is really the last slide to summarize what we have said so far, is that we wanted to um, really urge everybody to think about Whenever we are using algorithm to make predictions about personal outcomes, this commands the modeler to conceive a notion of individual risks in one way or another. And apparently perfect fairness as this requirement, it's something that is possible, however possible on, only under extremely idealized situations. And these are the situations that are very abstract and highly uh, untestable in reality. We have so shown you that in order to achieve that, we don't only require perfect data and that we have access to a perfect model, but we also have to have this very particular assumption about that individual risk is a deterministic function of its own attributes. Now, as soon as we step just a tiny bit away from all these idealized assumptions, perfect fairness become, uh, you know, starts to unravel. And we don't even have to go into the realm of bad data, unrepresentative data, or you know, terribly specified model. We just have to step back a little bit to have still good but smaller data or to give up on our notion of determinism. There, we would lose our grasp on perfect fairness. And now to understand this, uh, you know, that would perhaps be something that uh, would be done you know, in our future work is to, um, call for this theoretical exposition of how fairness uh, degrades as we gradually move away from these set of idealized assumptions and just at what rate and uh, under what situations this degradation is controllable within, um, uh, you know, within the algorithms or the modelers, uh, you know, uh, conscious. So, um, you know, as and also sort of as a as a note towards um, you know empirically, what do we propose as a resolution? And then what I want to say is that so far, you know, in order to address this apparent, you know, this empirically, there's not a way to really to resolve the impossibility theorems as they uh, realize themselves in in actual model building. And so far, the uh, step that has been taken from the machine learning literature is to use some kind of constraint optimization to say that. Fairness is really imposing an external constraint on our pursuit to accuracy. And let's try to do the, the model selection with fairness in mind as a constraint. Now, I think this is a very well-motivated uh, approach that is both practical and also theoretic, uh, decision theoretically uh, supported. But I think at the same time, we should understand that as soon as we begin to do that, there is um, a perhaps subtle change in the notion of exactly what we're after, exactly what we're now construing as individual risk. It may not be what we thought we are after anymore. So that's something to keep in mind. And we are thinking, and this is really for future work potentially, that perhaps is there any other way that we can put a you know, more positive spin instead of thinking about fairness as a constraint, but rather as a catalyst in the sense that we're now seeing that fairness and accuracy can have this tiny intersection just when everything is perfect. But can we also think about fairness as a criterion that is asking for a higher order sense of accuracy, namely subgroup accuracy, that the model, we're demanding the model to perform not only well, but also well 
for every one of the groups. And this is related to uh, the sense of subset calibration, which is discussed in Phil Davis' paper on individual risk, uh, in a relational sense that we would like to achieve, uh, you know, or pose higher order senses of accuracy in the in the relational sense, in the subgroup sense, and perhaps be able to bring the pursuit of fairness and accuracy along to the same lines. So uh, that's really it. And here are a select uh, collection of references. And uh, we are very happy to take questions. Thank you very much for listening. Wonderful. Thanks so much for that. Um, that really blasted the cobwebs out at 9 o'clock on a, on a Thursday morning. Um, superb stuff. OK, so the way we do the Q&A, um, for those of you who are attendees, if you put your question into the Q&A panel, um, I'll draw it out from there. And those of you who are panelists who are on video, if you raise your hand, I will come to you and I will I will aim to sort of rotate between different disciplinary perspectives. Um, and then as Michael says in the chat, we'll continue the discussion over on the Slack after our hour is up. Um, so we'll start with, uh, with a computer question from computer science. Um, Le Xing, would you like to take the first question, please? Oh, yeah. Um... Thank you both for the very thought-provoking talk and the clarity of analysis. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I, um, so uh, I'll start with the specific question, which was um, one of the slides you said, well, this idealistic scenario has four assumptions. Um, you have essentially tweaked and varied three of them. And I was wondering whether, well, the fourth assumption was model misspecification. Um, I wonder whether you have thoughts about how to do that one, uh, especially in relationship, in relationship to, say, classifier transparency or not. I, I know that that one can probably should be analyzed in a way that's different than being done here. Um, would you agree? Does that make, make sense? Um, I'll, I'll try to get us give a stab at your question. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate um, the. This is a great question. I think this really is model mess specification is something that is again some kind of a conceptual thing, and we almost always think that we never really do have the right model in reality. Um, the way that we are uh, playing with that assumption in our analysis is instead of thinking that the model is misspecified, we are. Uh, misspecifying some attributes. So that's the graph where Marcelo showed that we have these uh, additional predictors that shouldn't be there that was put into the model. And what you see there is that, first of all, it slows the rate at which you can achieve good accuracy and good fairness. And also it's because you also spend these extra efforts to estimate these extraneous um, uh, parameters, it actually makes the model overall performance worse because you're spending, uh, you know, energy on things that shouldn't be, shouldn't be there. Um, it, I think this question is very deep because when we only care about prediction accuracy, um, exactly what we mean by model specification is also a questionable context. In estimation, we have a very precise notion the model has to be correct, but it, we can have a bad model in that the model isn't really respecting the gener generating mechanism of the data, but can still achieve good predictive accuracy. It's possible, and I don't know if you know what's what's available now right now with all these deep learning things or black box, which is perhaps not what you want. But if the model is so um, intricately and and massively parameterized and really able to find this very fine grained map between the attribute space and the outcome space, maybe there is a way that it can even exhaust all the possibilities and be able to deliver predictive accuracy. We don't know that, <laughs> but it's it's some kind of a thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that answer. Um, so it just um, yeah, as you were talking, I realized that. So um, my group have been recently looking at a little bit at the long-standing literature of universal approximation of, uh, in particular, these the neural network models. Um, so in that case, it basically says if your model is a certain class of functions, it's able to approximate any function that you want in. Um, in that case, maybe the problem of model specification is converted to like one of those um, that you outlined before, uh, basically the estimation bias and variance and, um, and so on. 
Right, exactly. But I think, you know, your emphasis on transparency is important too, because part of fairness as a way of communicating with the users, it has to, transparency regardless is, is just adding to the equation. So um, unfortunately, that's not something that deep learning could provide. <laughs> So there's something to think about. Or that's working for the best. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah, right, exactly, yes. Okay, um, so the next question is going to come from uh, from Mario, from the Perspective of Philosophy. Yeah, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, Robin and Marcelo. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I find your notion of determinism very interesting. So if I understood the... the to talk correctly, you say something like if we had perfect information, if we had all the information we can wish for, it is still good to have this uh, deterministic function as compared to like a like non-deterministic or statistical function uh, um, to get a better prediction, like a perfect prediction. And, and I find that uh, very interesting. I would like to hear more why, why the deterministic assumption adds something on certain other distributions like non-deterministic functions. And also, if you zoom out a little bit, um, isn't it a problem to use a deterministic function where you also have like, you know, like super many attributes as kind of a guiding idea where we should go? Uh, namely, in the moment where you think about privacy. So we also we don't want that all the information of individuals are given to, to some institution or so. Like if you think about a bank loan application or so. Like, like I see a new um, field of tension here, uh, and I hope you, you understand what I mean. Thank you. <laughs> should, I, should I give it? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, Robin, you, you start, and then I, I can add something. Oh, okay, more. sure. I'm, I'm sure you have more to say about uh, that I, you know, I was using the word determinism in a very naive way that uh, Marcelo would pick on me to say that, you know, this ha thing has, has deeper meanings. Um, <laughs> we, both situations are hypothetical and we just, the distinction in our simulations, so uh, it's, it doesn't exceed the fact that, you know, we, we are, is there this ultimate layer of indeterminacy that we are assuming that you can or cannot have have access to. And that's the only thing that's making the so-called distinction between determinism and objective chance. Um, in reality, again, um, even if you think that the world is deterministic, you can never have access to as many predictors as you possibly can, especially for you know thinking about these realistic restrictions of policy and so on. So, if, if you like to take this pessimistic view that the world is a de facto object, you know, object of chance, everything is ultimately random because there are just things that they're unknowable, whether out of legal reasons, out of epistemological reasons. Um, but then if you think that the, perhaps the message we have is negative, that, that you know, in general situations, uh, perfect fairness with all things simultaneously satisfied may not be achievable. Thank you. Yeah, so if I can add one, one thing, it's a, it's a great question and a very difficult question, but a discussion that Robbie and I had uh, multiple times is what is this notion of risk that we are trying to uh, capture? So you could, you, could think, uh, you could think ultimately that there is just, uh, there is an outcome that you want to predict and that outcome is essentially zero or one. Either these events happens or doesn't happen. And presumably there has to be some deterministic path that leads to that outcome. So that seems a plausible view of the world. Uh, on the other hand, it, it, could, it could very well be that that outcome is just uh, generated by, by, by the flip of a coin without any clear uh, deterministic path. And I, and I think the, I mean, the, the, the really difficult question is uh, in, in, in which conditions are we? And this we cannot really test. We cannot really tell whether, we, and so if this has such, um, 
important impact in the ability of the algorithm to make prediction and also in the ability of the algorithm to deliver fairness, that's, I think, something that we, we need to think about uh, seriously because it is ultimately an untestable assumption. And so we cannot know whether the algorithm is performing badly in terms of accuracy or fairness because of reasons that are inherent to the algorithm itself or or because of this, uh, you know, fundamental difference in how the world uh, works. Thanks. Okay, so um, I'm going to keep um, the next couple of questions. We've got a few questions that are sort of more on the um, kind of application side, and we've got a few that are more on the technical side. I'm going to keep going with some of the technical stuff and then come to the more applied ones um, after, just to sort of keep the flow um, going. And the next question comes from, um, so we've had, we've had computer science, we've had philosophy, um, and now we have uh, an AE psychologist, Michael Smithson, um, who has asked, um, uh, so this is a statistical one, you guys will understand this better than me, I'm just going to read it out. Often predictor coefficients differ across relevant groups. What happens to fairness when group measurement membership is entered as a moderator into the model? Hi, Michael. Uh, good to see you here. Um, excellent question. The way that we built our simulation is that group entered as in that the conditional distribution with some of the attributes differ uh, depending on the group membership. We did not enter group as a moderator or anything perhaps as an interaction term in the model because due to the consideration that oftentimes in reality, people would think that group membership cannot be used as a predictor in building the model. Um, but it's a good question that if this was used as a part of the construction process, but nevertheless, the model is misspecified that we are not fitting the model with these, what would happen? Now we have never tried, but that's a great, great point. Okay, so, um... Yeah, as well as as well as the academic approaches, there's also we also have folks from industry here, and there's a comment on the technical side uh, from Chris Dolman um, with his insurance actuary hat on. Um, so he writes the general approach in the insurance industry context is to reject determinism out of hand. Contracts go way too long into the future to even entertain the idea, and further argue predictive accuracy of the underlying riskiness, i.e., ex ante expected loss, as fair. Um, rather than measuring outcomes ex post, i.e. whether certain people claimed or not. Uh, this is based on an economic argument more than anything else. Risk transferred should be transferred at expected risk cost, irrespective of outcomes after the fact. Uh, what are your thoughts on this notion of fairness? Um, if you'd like Chris to expand on that, I can, I can allow him to talk if you would like some more uh, on that. I, I think I would like to hear more, unless Robin has grasped the question fully. No, no, I, I was going to say if uh, if you could please expand on the notion, because I think it's not clear in my head how would you, what would be that, exactly the question is, what would you conceptualize as the risk as opposed to using the outcome? What is that thing that you're then judging the model against? Okay, Chris, hopefully you, you're, this is the first time we've tried this, so hopefully you're able to talk now. Let's, let's see, if you can't hear me, you won't be able to tell me you can't hear me, but maybe you can nod if you can. Excellent. We can't hear you. Okay, so I, I guess um, in the industry, this is, this is a topic I've written about before. I'm happy to send you one of my papers after the fact, which you might find interesting, but I guess... Um, in the industry context, the, the idea that you'd measure sort of who's claimed and who's not after the fact and sort of measure either claims or not claims sort of as in a group fairness type setup um, ju just seems a little counterintuitive because whether you claim or not is sort of a random draw more than anything else. Um, a draw that's biased depending on your underlying riskiness, but there's certainly a level of chance there that's important to recognize. So... Um, you sort of just reject determinism because there's always going to be some chance that, uh, you know, maybe you don't have the data for it or maybe it is genuine chance. You know, we can argue about that, um, but there's likely to be some chance there. And so if you're buying an insurance contract to protect yourself from future risk, um, there's a, 
a, a long argument that's run that basically says economically what you should do is price that contract at the sort of expected claims costs before the fact. And then some people are going to claim, some people are going to not, but that's sort of irrelevant. What you need to do before the fact is charge people an appropriate price based on your under, understanding of their actual risk beforehand. Um, so in the insurance context, some of these group fairness notions, particularly the ones dependent on outcomes, sort of um, don't quite make sense. But I wondered if you had any thoughts on the topic or if you sort of thought about it at all, because it's very sort of related to what you've been talking about. Yeah, so I uh, I think uh, I think we would like to see your paper and then and think about it more. But uh, it does seem that in the in the insurance context, you um, while for example in the criminal justice context, you might be very interested in in learning as much as you can about an individual, so that you really give an individualized risk about that individual. In the insurance company, it seems that you are okay in treating a bunch of individuals as exchangeable with one another so long as at the end of the day you you manage to make a profit in the long run uh, so that might be a, a a difference between the criminal justice context and the insurance uh, context and 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 the notion of individual risk and the degree of, of uh, fine gradeness or amount of information that is, that is required might be different in, in the two contexts. And so that might also be why certain notion of group fairness, uh, you saying don't, don't make sense in, um, um, in, the, in, the, in the insurance company and the insurance uh, context. A another issue seems to be that while it might be optimal to get as close as you can to individual risk and therefore collect as much information as possible, as Robin was explaining in the multi-resolution framework, that gives rise to, to a higher variance. And so the, the risk that you determine might not be, you know, might not be uh, uh, actually tracking uh, um, uh, the long the long run frequency that you're going to have, and so in the insurance companies that you might have maybe more losses that you would expect. Uh, but anyway, I think we we need to think about more, and and we want to see your paper, of course. Thanks. So I'll, I'll definitely have a chat with you after the fact. I think, but yeah, I'll, I'll send you some stuff, and maybe we can have a chat. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Good stuff. Okay, so now on to law. Um, so Luria Bennett Moses, um, a lawyer here at UNSW, um, writes in the Q&A, a number of standards are being drafted to deal with issues like bias and fairness in the context of artificial intelligence and or autonomous and intelligent systems. Um, what are the implications of this approach for how such standards should be approached? So I'll, I'll, I'll try to give a, a, a stab at this. So I think it, um, it depends how I would, I would like to see how these standards um, are, are written in the law. But I think one, one of the message of the talk is that there are these multiple factors that affect the performance on fairness of, of your classification algorithm. And these factors could be um, uh, how many attributes you are considering? What about your uh, your your, uh, your the specification of your model? What about the, the deterministic assumption, etc.? So I think uh, now these attribute these these assumptions that affect the the fairness performance of the algorithm should be taken into account. Uh, in whatever standards are being drafted when you assess the, the fairness of an, of an algorithm. Now, the catch here, however, is that as, as Robin and I have been trying to say, is that some of these assumptions are untestable. And so I, I, I really don't know what to say in, in that sense because 
when you're trying to draft these standards for fairness to, to assess uh, uh, the performance of algorithm and you're trying to build them in the law, I guess the assumption is that there is some empirically verifiable criteria that you can latch onto. And, 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 and our, our point is that we're not so sure that everything is empirically verifiable. And so there is, there is a degree of uncertainty or kind of deep uncertainty there. Uh, so maybe it's bad news for, for those who are trying to draft uh, standards in the law, but uh, we'll, we'll have to, uh, I, I'd like to, to hear more about, about those, those standards. Okay, so someone, um, the person who asked how we'd explain either of McFairness to a business executive who doesn't understand the field, um, for that person, I would recommend, if you look at our channel, um, there's a video by uh, the talk by Clinton Castro, um, which I think was a sort of a really useful introduction to um, to the field um, that I would target at a, um, a sort of a, a more general audience. With uh, with this one for Marcelo and Robin yesterday, I told them that we've all done a lot of um, of the intro work, so they should feel free to to hit us with the hard stuff. Um, so um, I want to I want to stick to that. I, but I do have a, a final question just from me. Um, so this is coming more from the perspective of political philosophy. Um, now. This is partly just a matter of framing. Like I think all the things that you're showing here are really interesting and important. And I think that one of the things that would be really cool to do would be if you're able to make some of this, um, some of these things uh, available so people can play with them. I think it's a, it could be a really useful resource. Um, but I suppose there's a framing issue, which is that when you present things um, in this light, it's sort of like you're saying that the, the unfairness at stake is, is kind of like a cosmic unfairness. Like even if we do our absolute best, like the way the world is, like our inability to know whether there's determinism or objective chance, our inability to capture all the information, it just makes unfairness this sort of unavoidable, almost fact of nature. Um, and that, and it, and it sort of, it, it obscures the ways in which the unfairness that is caused by and is revealed by algorithmic um, prediction systems is very much something that's a product of the societies that we live in, the, the social structures that have engendered, you know, uh, long histories of, um, of unequal power relations. Um, and, you know, it, there, there is a bit of a danger with some of the more technical work on um, algorithmic fairness, um, that it, it can lead to a kind of um, throwing up our hands and saying, well, you know, what can we do? determinism or whatever, you know, like, whereas really the, the issues that are causing the actual negative implications and impacts of these um, systems, you know, just taking Compass as one example, I've said this before on this, on this seminar series, you know, take, take any, any algorithm prediction system, take one designed by, by God and apply it in the context of mass incarceration in the US and the sort of structural injustice that you have um, and structural racism that you have there. And it's, it's not going to be any good. Like it's, it's just going to sort of compound the existing injustice. So I guess the, the, the comment is, I think it's really valuable when doing this kind of technical work to sort of say at some point at the beginning or end, look, obviously the real problem here is structural racism in the US and, you know, the sort of whatever we do at the margins within um, algorithmic fairness is, is only going to be sort of window dressing on that. Um, but then I do think that there is a sort of, there's a substantive philosophical point there as well, which is like, um, yeah, do we, um, how do we sort of put together the kinds of, how do we situate the kinds of formal constraints on achieving fairness that you've described alongside the, if you like, social or structural constraints on achieving fairness um, that a you know, political philosopher or a sociologist or someone like that um, might, um, might bring to the fore. Uh, and I think that could be an interesting part of the conceptual framework that you, that you provide if you're able to think in those terms. Uh, thank you very much, Seth. I think, um, yes, I absolutely agree with what you said. And I think it's such a wonderful point that you're making. Uh, and this is perhaps something that, you know, thinking with in light of what you said and thinking about what you said in the first 30 minutes, this is not something that really came out uh, very well, because I think the work that Marcel and I did really was to, we kind of really was acting as and thinking from the inside perspective of if we were the person that are tasked to build 
build a model, then Nell would have to start to put out these predictions. What do I need to know, even for myself as a guiding principle, the theoretical breakdowns of what is practically achievable? I think this is exactly why in the towards the end, I think we're pushing for, we understand very well how to decompose the lack of accuracy in the predictive model. We do not understand how fairness or the lack of fairness decomposes. And this is the, exactly the kind of theoretical pr guiding principles that we need to be there so that we know what is uh, expected. Good morning. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to hang on. Hang, hang on, I'm just, I'm trying to. Sorry, <laughs> where were you? Right, exactly. So, so as I was saying, um, I, we do not have a theoretical guiding principle yet. I think that's where uh, a decomposition into, you know, we haven't answered the question at all. If what if what if we do have garbage data? What would that do to the model? And exactly what is the distance and how far away we are? And how do we in fact peel that away from the model performance? And that is the question that we need to answer. But you know, all taken together, it's you know, we I think you know it, to to only look at things empirically is one thing that we're doing practically, but also further you know now we, we kind of need to have this higher order sense of what we should expect. Of things. Um, yeah, I, th I think you know, the, the possibility that the <clears throat> the, the risk, store, risk scores of themselves will contribute to the background injustice. You know that you know you'll you'll end up, for example, sending more police to an area that has already been over policed and will lead thereby to, to more arrests and what have you is, is a part of that too. Um, now we have um, we've we've hit our time, um, so we'll have to continue over on the Slack. Um, so for, for everyone here, um, thanks so much, uh, Robin and Marcelo, for, for doing this. It was really great. Just the kind of research we want to see as part of this. Um, and um, let's uh, give the customary round of applause. Um, and if you're able to head over to the Slack to answer any further questions, people in the audience, um, please head over there too. Michael's put up a, um, a, a link to join. Um, and then we'll call it a day. Thank you.